confession this morning. All right, confession to open confession. One, two. As I said to listen to the word of God today, a door of utterance has been opened unto us, and I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me. This is the way to go, walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the Spirit of God, and I'm not distracted by anything or anyone. The word of God is full to my spirit. I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It is oil to my face, causing my life to shine, giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things to me. He also brings to my remembrance things Jesus once showed me. I come to understand God's system on the earth, and I receive instruction, encouragement, correction, and enablement to live out God's will. Amen. All right, um, today will be our final teaching on our preparation for WAFBEC 2023. All right. And um, this principle and what I want to teach on is your personal preparation for the meeting. That is your own personal preparation for the meeting. But this is applicable to every other meeting that you attend, even for church uh, services um, every um, Sunday. It's how you um, obtain or receive uh, spiritual uh, encounters with God in meetings like this. Um, so we are sharing on this how to personally prepare uh, for it. I mean, last week we read out the testimony of a lady who, I mean, just consciously prepared for the anointing service and her conscious preparation for it brought about a massive breakthrough in her own life. So it's something that can be used in your everyday life. Don't just take it as something we do for Wavbeck, and then after Wavbeck, we drop all right, the practice of the principles. Now, first thing that we said is in coming, when you are coming for a spiritual meeting or gathering, you have to be intentional about it. What that means is that your mind is involved, not just your physical presence, but the way and manner in which your thoughts are arranged towards the meeting. So you are focused on a clear-cut objective or reason why you are going into the place. And as simple as this sounds, many of us omit it that is, the second thing is take to God in prayer. And we said for Wavec, three major things or a major thing you want out of the meeting. That is, you take it to God in prayer and present it to him. Now, the reason is that the system of God his kingdom, what we'll call an ecosystem. The way things work inside his, in his kingdom, there is a system to it. Now, once you don't understand the system, all right, so that particular thing, then you start missing out at some point, and you won't, you know, you'll be wondering what is really going on. Now, what you do is to present it to God in prayer and then ask that God direct the anointing in the meeting towards these particular issues that you are bringing forth and establish a contract with God in prayer concerning it. When I say contract, 
like coming into a covenant with God in prayer concerning it. Stay in the place of prayer at about 3 a.m. or 3.24 a.m. to be exact. Uh, let me just share this. A minister in church sent me a message and he said, yes, that when we were praying, you talked about spending a long time, spending time in prayer. And he said, you seem to have changed your mind about saying the long amount of time you should spend in prayer to be able to get to that place where you start hearing God. Could you tell me the amount of time you should spend? And I, I smiled because I actually thought about it and looked at the congregation and said, don't let me bring anybody under in sense of guilt, all right, if they are unable to pray this long. So let me just stop from saying it. So he actually asked me, he said, what is the stipulated time you feel you should spend to get to that point? And I told him, I'm not going to say it, okay? But I'm not going to say it because I don't want anybody to, to say that, ah, may I just pray 15 minutes so and then they are telling me this kind of time to spend in prayer. And then you pray 30 minutes. God may hear you in 30 minutes, but you start feeling guilty that you have not spent the amount of time we've said you should spend. So I don't know the stamina. Anybody that asks me that privately is ready to stay. <laughs> but I can't say it publicly. But you stay until you get a note of victory. All right? And when you get a note of victory, right, what happens is, and I was going to say this, in a corporate prayer meeting. Some people say, well, so how do you know a note of victory? If you're all praying together in a corporate prayer meeting, and you come to a point, for, like, for example, yesterday, there was a point where the note of victory came. If you ask everybody inside the meeting, what time did the note of victory come? If they were looking at their wristwatch, it would be exactly the same time. In other words, you are pushing against a demonic force, and you got to a point where you overcome, overcame that demonic force, and at that point, everybody inside their heart, they will register all right, that they have gotten a note of victory at that particular point. So, all right, there's, a, there's an amount of time you spend into a place where uh, you have heard clearly from God concerning uh, the particular thing. Now, what do we mean by God directing the anointing towards you as a person? Now, let's read this in Romans chapter 10 from verse 11. All right, just follow me on this and say something. Romans chapter 10 and verse 11. Uh, the Bible says, the scripture says, King James, please. All right, the scripture says that whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. All right, so it says, whosoever believeth on Jesus shall not, all right, be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is rich over all that call upon him. Then verse 13 it says, And whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall, not can, not may, all right? Not is possible, it is shall. In other words, if I take a glass here, if they brought a glass of water to me, and I take up that glass and, and I'm about to do this, Everybody here will know with all certainty that if I throw the glass down with the force that I have used, all right, to take it up, and they can see the intent, they know that the glass cup will shatter. That is, it shall shatter. So if I throw it on the ground and it hits the ground and starts bouncing, you will know it is not glass. Okay? Because once it's glass, that way it shall. Now, so whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall, not may, not can, but shall be saved. So if we are not experiencing the salvation, when we say we pray, then it must mean that we are not fulfilling what that scripture means by call upon the name of the Lord. Because it tells us in verse 11, whosoever believeth on him, put it up, will not be ashamed. Then in 13 it says, whosoever calls upon him shall, all right, be saved. Then it goes in verse 14 and says this, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed. All right? 
So the person believes and out of that belief, he calls on the name of the Lord. But then he says, how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? Then he says, how shall they hear without a preacher? Then he goes on and says, how shall they preach except they be sent? In other words, what the scripture is saying is this. If a preacher is sent to an individual, that individual will believe what is preached unto them. Let me repeat. If a preacher is sent to somebody, that person will believe when they hear and that belief there will bring about, that type of believing he describes here, will bring about the result in the life of that particular person without fail. In other words, what is required is that somebody be sent to that person because once that person is sent there, the words of that person will cause that individual to believe and when they call on God concerning that thing, they shall be saved. All right? So it's about being sent. So when you are praying, I want to explain what it means here, all right, to be sent. So it's about being sent, that the person must be sent. Now, it's not whether the person is anointed. It's whether the person is sent. Uh, Jesus said, were well, there not many widows in Israel? Elijah was anointed. But only to the widow at Zarephath was he sent. And once he was sent to that person, that person got results. Bible tells us Elisha was sent to the, to, the, to, to the leper and the leper got results because he was sent to that person. And when they are sent, the word they bring is not now hear this, what you hear is not the general theology of Christ, but the specific instructions on what you should do in that situation to bring about a transformation. So hear me very well. If you have 2,000 people somewhere, what I'm saying is that the minister, based on the way the 2,000 people are prepared, the minister may be sent to 30. The 2,000 people hear the same message, but those 30 people will perceive and understand what they should do in their own given situation to change things around. They are not there with the general concept of the message. They come out with specific instructions on what they should do in that particular situation to bring about the salvation of God in their life. That's when, uh, all right, you are hearing from that sense point. So being sent really is not dependent on the preacher. It's actually dependent on the people. Now I'll explain this. And once a person is sent, you know, Kenneth Hagin said something, I understand it perfectly. He said he was preaching to his uncle once. And he preached to him for about 10 years to get saved. The man did not. He prayed, prayed. He said one day, that's why we need to get the ecosystem properly. He said one day, he was reading the Bible and God said, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are full. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. So God told him, pray that I will send somebody to preach to your uncle instead of you going to preach to him. He said he went to God and prayed. Three days after the man got saved. God has a system once we understand it. Now, once somebody is sent to you, all right, there will be no issue. They will hear God as you ought to hear in terms of what to do. Not that you will hear that by the stripes of Jesus you are healed. You will hear in your own spirit what you ought to do in order to get it. And this is God's system of doing things. In other words, you pray to him about an issue. What God does is that he will raise somebody somewhere 
and send that person to you. That is the system of God. And once that person comes in and you understand that, your heart will be open, waiting for it. Once it comes in to you there, that's why the Bible says, not holding the head through which all the body, by joints and bands, have nourishment ministered. Now you're holding on to the head Christ. All right, as your only source, but he's going to use channels, which means joints and bands. Put up the scripture in Colossians. Yeah? All right, joints and bands has nourishment ministered. So he ministers nourishment through joints and bands in order to get to you as a person. All right, so being sent now, that's not holding the head. So you hold on to the head, you're not holding on to the people. You are holding on to the head, but the head, through joints and bands, has nourishment ministered and knit together. Now, God has done it this way so that there will be no pride in anybody's heart. Which means that he will make sure that people are involved so that you don't start feeling, all right, like, you know, you and God, you know, just you and God in heaven. All right, and, and have that sense of exaltation over other people. It keeps, all right, the system balanced. That's why it says there's no schism in the body, so that the body, nobody will come up with pride, or he won't, his actions won't tempt any person to get into pride there that, you know, it, people are involved in bringing this thing to pass, all right, within the life of that particular individual. That's why it says in Isaiah chapter 30. Let's say this, Isaiah chapter 30. It says in verse 19. All right, we can start from 19. Yeah. Isaiah 30 and verse 19. For the people shall dwell in Zion, thou shalt weep no more. But he will be gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry when he shall hear it. Now, these were people that were first of all running around. And they were left as an ensign upon the hill. Go to verse 18. It says they were there as an ensign upon the hill there. And then it says, verse 17, it says that, and you shall be left, verse 17, 1,000 shall flee, and you shall be left as a beacon at the top of a mountain as an ensign on a hill. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious unto thee, verse 18. All right? And he will be exalted that he may have mercy upon thee. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are they that wait for him. Then the people, all right, that dwell at Zion, in Jerusalem thou shalt weep no more. He will be gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. Now what is his answer? Though the Lord give the bread, next verse, of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not your teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers, and your ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, this is the way to go. Now you are fired up of prayer because of the adversity, and what God said is, cost your eyes to see the teachers, that's the way he answers it, and then you now know the way in which you should go. Which means it's not now we're running around because guess what? You know clearly the way you should go. The widow at Zarephath knew what she was supposed to do. Naaman knew exactly what he was supposed to do there. All right? He saw it. It's called he perceived it in the spirit. From the scriptures he perceived it. These things are scriptural, but you can't quote a scripture to back the action. Are you following what I'm saying here? You can't say to somebody else, go and dip yourself seven times in a pool. But it's while the ministry of the word is going on, you just see the thing on the inside there. All right? And then you go and act on it. The other people come out with the knowledge of the fact that God is willing to heal. You come out with the knowledge of what to do. You see the difference here? Others come out and say, God loves widows, and he really has a heart for widows, and he has told people that they should support widows, and all of that. Another person knows, this is what I'm supposed to do. Someone comes out and says, ah, things on the outside are quite difficult in Nigeria, on the outside. And they've told us, Nigeria will be great. In the meeting, they prophesied, God is going to do something in Nigeria. Another person comes out with, go and put your money here, and everything happening in this country will turn out for your good. Do you get what I'm saying? Is, you understand this? 
I'm saying, well, I'm praying for someone to get healed and all of that. And then somebody else, and then say, well, God will answer my prayer. And that person comes and says, go and tell the person. Go and tell that person that I asked this person to do so and so in their lifetime. Go to the sick bed, tell the person. Tell that person, make the decision to do what God said you should do. And you'll be out of this place in a week. And the person breaks out into tears and says what? And brings out a book and says, you know, I was reading, I came to that conclusion. You're a confirmation of this. Pray for me. I agree I will do it. Do you get what I'm saying here? And they get up and leave. You can't transfer that to somebody else. You can't tell somebody to go and dip themselves seven times now in the pool and you'll get healed. It's not the water that has the healing. It's the voice of God. Now, so let me show you what we're saying. Exodus chapter 3 here, verse 4. And this God's system. This is the way he works it. That's why when Cornelius prayed to God, the angel came, but the angel said, look, it's not me going to tell you anything. Send for one Simon by Jonah. He shall tell thee words by which thou and thy house shall be saved. He will tell you the words. The instructions he will give them to you. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, this Moses, and called, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And then he told him, he said, draw out now, hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the Lord God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his faith, for he was afraid to look upon God. And verse 7, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction, all right, of the people of Egypt. I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Verse 8, I am come down. Now, it was these people that prayed, and God said, I've heard their prayer. Their request is to be delivered from the oppression and the bondage of the Egyptians. So I have come down to do it. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egypt and to bring them out of the land into a good land that flows with milk and honey. Verse 9, he said, I heard... All right, the cry of Israel has come unto me. I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Verse 10, he says, Come now therefore, and I will send you. So, the minute Moses, that's where Moses was sent. What caused Moses to be sent was the prayers of the people. They were crying, all right, that their bondage, they were in bondage, and they were crying unto God concerning it. God said, I have heard their prayer. I am therefore sending you. So a person, but they themselves didn't really get the system. That's why they were fighting Moses. Same thing Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and those that I send to you. He said, how often will I have gathered everything? He said, now your house is left unto you desolate. He said, you will not see me again until you say in your heart, blessed is he that comes to me in the name of the Lord. Which means that, Lord, I now understand it. When you answer my prayer, you send people. Blessed is that person that comes to me in the name of the Lord. Now, when you're like that, then God has developed meekness inside you because you understand that, you know, you can't do this thing alone. All right? You can't attribute everything, all right, to yourself. So, you pray, and then you open up yourself and say, God, send. And once he sends, all right, to you, he raises up a voice to speak to you. What happens is it redirects everything you hear at that particular level, you perceive. That's why Jesus said, hearing they heard not, and seeing they didn't perceive. You come to the place where you perceive by the Spirit of God. All right? And in your everyday life, it doesn't even have to be a physical person that comes to speak to you. And you could get books there. For Paul himself, this is what they said of Paul. They said his letters, that's his books, are weighty and powerful. But his bodily presence is weak. In fact, what they were saying was, this man that is coming to preach to us, he doesn't write these letters because these letters are witty and powerful. This man, maybe he's doing plagiarism. Somebody else is writing in his team. And they were trying to undermine his ministry. And Paul said, when I come, you will know 
that what is written, I will be so unto you physically. In other words, what Paul was saying was that I will match my letters by my presence. So you see how much powerful letters are, what books are. Kenneth Hagin never came to Nigeria. Kenneth Hagin never entered Africa. I don't think there's anybody who has influenced Christianity in this continent as much as Hagin. But he never stepped into this continent. But what did he do? He sent his books there. All right? And books are very, very powerful. And the reason why they say they're very, very powerful is that books will just give you the information without anything. No biases, no prejudice. Okay? Uh, you can look at somebody and say, I don't like this person. And because you don't like the person, the way the person is, you don't listen properly to it. But if you say book, you don't see the person. Do you get what I'm saying here? So there's no judgment of whether the person, you know, let, let's assume, a, you know, people do it more for women. Let's assume a woman comes to preach now, and she's written a book, uh, like we brought somebody for a meeting here. I, I just couldn't believe it. Someone came to me and said, I, I just didn't like the way she dressed. You know, it's only women they say that for. They don't say that for men. I say, I, I just don't like the way. And it's a woman that was saying to a woman, no, it's not like this man. No. All right? I don't like the way she dressed. I don't think it was really appropriate. What does that have to do with what I say here? What is the unappropriateness? It was sleeveless. Now, you don't hear the person again. It's sleeveless you are looking at. Uh, do you get what I'm saying? But if you are reading book, there's no whether the person is sleeveless or whether the short. You will just take the information. That's why books sometimes are more effective. All right? That's why any real person will tell you, uh, come and say, uh, can you tell me your secret to success? They'll tell you it's inside my book. If you can't get it from the book, you can't get it from me, brother. So Acts chapter 7, verse 35, it says this. Acts 7, now you see the change. Uh, this Moses whom they had refused, said, who made a ruler and a judge, the same God did send. Now, all right, to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel that appeared to him. So when that sending goes forth, angelic beings are operating also there. That is, the people who have up, pulled up their prayer to God and come in consciously, there is angelic activity when it comes to their own operation there in order for them to be able to see and in order for them to be able to hear. Exodus 13 and verse 3. All right, Exodus 13 and verse 3. Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which you came out of the house of bondage, for by the strength of the hand of the Lord, he brought you out of this place. So there is that recognition there that the hand of God now gets involved in it. So pray that way for your own self, present your needs there, and ask God, understanding that, what you are going to do is hear the specific things that you should do as a person, not just the generality of the promises, but the specific things that you should do in that particular situation to bring about the change. The second thing is, all right, I want to talk about inviting people into the meeting, whether it's physical or online. Now, and there's a spiritual way of doing this, and it also affects all right, or let me say, it maximizes, all right, what happens or what will happen in your own life in the, in the particular meeting. Now, this is the context in which you are coming to the meeting, so you want to transfer that to others. Now, everything that God, or let me say, let me put this, let me rephrase it. God um, loves quietness. God uh, is not... If you are too loud, you, you reduce the effectiveness and the in, spiritual impact of things. Uh, because God, the Bible says, he, he loves an ornament of a meek and quiet spirit in the sight of God is of great price. Okay? It's in quietness the most powerful things are done. And I said, I was teaching about it, I think in Abuja, and I was talking about quietness. And look, if we want to bring people now into a meeting now, let's just say all of us here decide. 
Now, you can say you want to have a meeting and uh, let's, okay, let's go out, let's be shouting, all right, we're back, ah, uh, we're back, we're back, we're back, we're back, we're back, you know, and all of this. But very few things are done without relationships. Listen to what I'm saying. I want to say what I've never said before. Very few things are done without relationships. And I remember, I learned this lesson. Many years ago, I went to invite Andrew Womack for Wabek. I invited him the first year. He said I won't be able to make it. I invited him the second year. He said I won't be able to make it. Listen, I've never said this before publicly. Third year, his associate called me and said, look. He said he doesn't go anywhere without there being an existing relationship between him and that person. Which means that he, 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 that's, the, that's how he goes. So they are not drawn again, say, oh, you put our face on poster, we are going, and all of that. They, they just, and it's a correct mindset. In other words, for example, you won't see someone like Bishop Oedipo preaching everywhere again. They only go to places where there is an existing relationship. Because their anointing requires a particular type of environment to function. And that person must know that kind of environment and make sure the environment is conducive or else they have wasted their time. And they don't have that kind of time to waste the game. They, they don't, putting their face on poster is not what will thrill them. Uh, you understand what I'm saying here? All right? You can go and preach somewhere and you finish, but you know, I, I just wasted my time there. There's no need to have come to this place. Huh? Okay, so you, you do that. So they understand that. That, look, there has to be that kind of thing for it to work. Also in dealing. So you can make noise, but if you don't build relationships, things don't really work. You can make a noise. Now, let me give an example. Redeemed. The largest gathering of Christians in the world happened, finished yesterday, which is Congress. How much noise did they make? to bring millions of people into that place. All right? Did you see them shouting, promo, 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 hey, 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 come, come, one on, one on. All right? Nothing. Did you even see them put ministers' faces? No. They're not using it to draw people. What they're going through are existing relationships with people on the ground, which used to pull people in. All right? which is what you would term as having a structure on ground, which means existing relationships. So if you want to invite a person into a meeting, let's assume now we want to invite. Now, all of us here can get 10,000 people into this meeting physically that will be turning people back without a radio promo. We can do it without spending one couple on radio promo. Now, what do you do? Or online. We can make it global. You say everybody here, if I say 10 people that you know outside this country, the meeting will be global. Because some of you know people in Canada, some people know people here, you know this country, so it will become global. All right? But we don't exploit these silent, deep things. In fact, somebody sent me a minister and looked at it and said, and I realized the fastest growing church in the world is in Iran today. That's where Christians are getting converted the most but you don't know one great man of God from Iran. Because if you become a great man of God there, you are dead. So they have to use what you call a silent, hidden structure to get it done without noise. Because noise will attract death. So they have to find a way of getting it done without making any noise. And then you go into the depth of God's wisdom to get that done. So let's assume we do this. Now, so we say, everybody, I want to show something. Get 10 people that you know. Okay, let me just run through it quickly. All right, 10 people that you know. So you, now, first thing about spiritual things. Don't just use your mind because it is possible. The fact that you have money to do something doesn't mean that you should do it. You have to learn the lesson of knowing that your only security is in the voice of God before God blesses you materially. Sure. So that material things do not become your security. Sure. That you, that, listen, when you don't have money to buy a house, you believe God. And then you follow the principles. When you have money, some people don't think, then they use money. 
In fact, in the office, I'll tell them, when I say, Pastor, what? I say, look, where are you? that was when we spent money without thinking. I don't do those things again. They always laugh. They say, Pastor, is this when there was money without that? It's not that there's more money now, but now you can't just tell me to go and do something without hearing heaven because it's a waste of time. So you spend time praying to God and praying and praying and praying and praying and saying, God, who are the 10 people? Who are the 10 people? Who are the 10 people um, to connect to this meeting? The fact that your neighbor is next door doesn't mean that he's your neighbor. The fact that they put a sticker and say, I love conventions, doesn't mean it's them. <laughs> are you following what I'm saying here? You start praying, and what happens is that God now brings it out. I mean, one of the speakers, Apostle Lumbega, how did he come to the meeting? Because somebody, God, sat, now, God can remind you of people from school that you knew. People 12, 15 years ago, and he shows you something in a flash. I say, ah, this is the person, I write that person's name down. And then it begins to guide you. And you're praying. And then you go out. You just interact with somebody. And you see somebody. is doing something. God says, that person is the person you should invite. That person is the person you should invite. That person. Now you have that. I mean, how did I invite this person? Somebody I knew. When we started church, we started church with us. All right. I relocated. Got married. And then after some time, relocated. And she just sent me. She, she, of course, she knows me. She just sent me a video and said, Pastor, listen to this video. That's all she said. All right, because they know not to tell me, invite this person. She just sent it. I, I looked at the video, I'd seen the person once on TBN. So I listened, I just put it at one point. I just dragged it to a point, I just listened. After 45 seconds, I switched the thing off. I said, I just, I said I'm inviting this person for Wolf Bake. I said, are you serious? I said, yes. But I knew she was thinking in that way because she's known me for 30 years that this man's spirit will resonate with you. When I called him, eventually I got him, and I say eventually now, I just sat down and I remembered I met somebody in Singapore who said he came for the meeting in Singapore because he watches Wav Beck, and from there I was the one that talked about Pastor How, and he follows the ministry. He gave me his number in Kenya, I just called him. I said, do you know this person in Uganda? He said, yes, I know him. I said, can you give me his number? He now said, all right, I'm going to call somebody who will give you. He gave me the person's number. I called the person. I spoke to the person. I dropped the phone. The person called me back. He said, oh. You know, I didn't know it was you. They just told me a name. They sent me now your profile. Ah, I, I, I follow you. And all of the person was talking. He said, I'll get you the number. He gave me the person's number. I called the person Lombega. He picked the phone. He said, listen, God told me. I said, I think it's time for you to come to Nigeria. I've listened to you. Nigeria, you should come in. Needs this anointing. He said, God spoke to me. I want you to move into Nigeria, but don't do anything about it. Sit down. A phone call will come. When that phone call comes, get up. He said, he said, I am rearranging my schedule in order to come. There's a way the Spirit does things. God knew who to bring up to trigger something in me. He knew that if I get this lady to say it, this man will consider it deeply because this person has been with him for years. So when I did that, I just called him and said it. Yesterday, he said, I have bought my ticket, my wife, all of us. He said, so that there's no mistake that, you know, we booked. They said there's no more flight. So just reimburse. The tickets are already bought. That shows that there's an intent in his heart. He knows that this thing is God. It's not a casual invitation. He knows that they, this is an assignment. So when you get the name, start praying. Now, this is what you now do. Once you get them, hold a conversation with them. And what you have done for yourself, do it for them. Find out what are the needs in their own life before the meeting. Take it up to God in prayer. And pray to God that the anointing in the house be sent to these people to address those needs. Once you have gotten a note of victory, then go and meet them. Say, listen. Enter into this meeting, I guarantee you. God will meet with you face to face, speak to you, and his power will meet you in this particular situation of your life if you come into it. Now, listen. By doing that, remember when Job prayed for his friends, his own captivity was turned around. There is a law in scripture that the husbandman that laboreth must be the first partaker of the fruit. In other words, must be the partaker of the first fruit. So anybody who engages in spiritual labor like that, in order for benefit to come to the whole, must take the first fruits of that benefit. By doing that, you have entered into a covenant with God about the level of blessing that will come to you. I'm telling you how this thing works. So. And are not coming on invitation. 
They are coming, all right, based on a spiritual thing that has gone on in the background. Do you get what I'm saying? Don't just bring people and say, come and just come and listen. You, look, how do people go to meet witch doctors? It's a problem. Anybody that goes to a witch doctor is a problem. It's not doctrine. The witch doctor doesn't teach anything. It's what? Problem. And let me tell you why people behave and they are so desperate that they will do anything. And you can use scripture to justify any behavior. That's why you see people rolling. They'll tell them that be rolling on the ground. Just be rolling. And they'll be beating them. Be rolling. You'll get your miracle. They'll be flogging them. You say, how can people do this? Because you know what those kind of people tell them? Those false people? They'll tell them that, didn't Elisha tell uh, Naaman to dip himself in the pool seven times? Wasn't he stupid? That's a stupid thing to do now. Naaman too knew he was stupid. So I'm telling you, your miracle will come. Start rolling. They start rolling. That's why you see people on social say, eat grass. They say, can I eat grass? They say, but they told somebody to dip themselves seven times in the pool. You know what, you know what dipping seven times in the pool now? It means that, it means that you are driving on express. Uh, I see somebody in Lagoon going in, coming out. Going in, coming out. <laughs> I hope you have the proper picture. <laughs> and then the man is healed. If that happens, do you know how many people will be in the Lagoon the next day? Everybody going in and coming out. All right, so let me close. So, the point is to find out what needs the person may have. Join, all right, in prayer, or enter into prayer, that the answer to the situation will come to him or her at the conference, and that's the basis, which means there's now a spiritual relationship behind the invitation. It's not just a physical thing here. There's, some, there's, a, there's a spiritual contract that is there between you and God, all right, in bringing that person in. And if you do that, all right, and that's why to implement that, I mean, you, the rich becomes powerful. And it's not just the rich as in we head. Okay? Because, look, Babek is being watched globally. In fact, there are people that tell me about things that, let me listen, that they should not be saying because they are core people in ministries, high-ranking people in other ministries who go and tweet that they are watching Wafbeck. And under normal circumstances, they shouldn't be tweeting like that. Because you are sending a message. So sometimes I say, well, yeah, you, you, have, you, have, you have mine, though. You are tweeting about something like this. So I know how far reaching it is and the depth to which it goes. Where was I uh, recently and uh, somewhere in Ibadan, yeah, uh, to go and preach for Bishop Taiwa Delaco. One chap, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm the pastor in I said, I don't miss Wafbeck. Everywhere I go, I see people, England, I do this, I don't, I, I was walking in, in Washington, on, going up the escalator in the airport, somebody was coming down the escalator, I said, I'm a pastor, I don't miss Wabek, I don't miss Wabek in Washington, so I know how far it is. But now it's not just for people to hear, but there's a spiritual, do you get what I'm saying here? Okay. Then the final one, I'm brief here, is this, and this is important, all right, decide, and I'm going to say this, what you will give to God before the meeting. This is important. Let me show you the scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 16. And let me say something, all right, about giving here. Deuteronomy 16, 16. This is where we got the idea of conferences from, from the word of God. That's camp meetings and everything. This is the scripture that people interpreted. Three times a year shall your milk appear before the Lord in the place where he shall choose. The feast of the unleavened bread, feast of weeks, feast of tabernacles. And you shall not appear before the Lord, what? empty. Now, if you think very well about that scripture, all right, every man shall give as he is able. I, I didn't even see that. Thank you for putting that up. According to the blessing which God had given thee. So, as every man is according to his what? Ability. Now, but what he's saying is, he says, don't let them appear empty because if they appear empty, they will go empty. That's what that thing is telling you. All right? Now, this is what giving is. I will just choose one day to give, every Friday night, I will do the giving. Because God told me, said, look, when you are doing things like this, eh, don't let the offering be a casual thing. This is God's point. If God ministers to somebody to give, let's just say this, in a, in a, um, a meeting, 50,000 naira. That's what God told the person. The person gave 50,000 naira on the first time they passed the offering bucket. It will be a sin for the person to give anything in addition to that 50,000 naira. If in the next session they pass a bucket again and just out of pressure 
and societal pressure he wants to give. For what God told you to give is 50,000 naira. Give it. Finish. So this passing, for me, oh, every session passing the offering bucket, I think trivializes the offering. You can't cut the gram into parts and be bringing it in parts. If he says this is what he wants, carry it and give it to God once and for what? All. All right? But even every time we're passing offering back, it's like, it's like, you don't just, don't, don't just do that. So it's a decision in God that you make. And you go up to God in prayer and he ask him. Now, when the Bible says Jehovah Jireh, it doesn't mean God my provider as you provide for your needs. That scripture means God shall provide himself an offering. So what you do is that, God, what is it as Jehovah Jireh? And he shows you and makes sure he ministers to you what to do because he ministers seed to the sower. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, it says, as every man has purposed in his heart. It's right, this given thing has been, has been adulterated. That's why it has, it says, according as every man has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, not out of necessity. This is not whether the, the conference has needs or not. That's not the issue. It says, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, when you give that way, there are seven things that guide a proper offering. There's just two of them. It has to be given, all right, or three, purposefully, all right, not out of any pressure. So once a minister starts bringing pressure, you are destroying the offering. All right, out, you are destroying what God wants to do. They give out of their heart willingly, and God loves a cheerful giver. Now, the next verse says, and God will cause all grace. Put the next verse. God is able to make all grace. That all grace is not just financial. Every grace is tied up to this. That's the truth. I'm not teaching on this, but if you look at it, it talked about the grace of diligence in this Second Corinthians book, grace of knowledge, grace of utterance. He said, all grace. So, and you check the Bible. I tell people, tell me, oh, God, we just give out of love. God doesn't want us to expect anything. That is not biblical, it is not scriptural, and it's not spiritual. God did not say you shouldn't expect. He said your expectation should be from him. What he's telling you is you shouldn't expect from anybody that benefited from your help. That is witchcraft. Witchcraft is I help you, then I tie a string to that help. So I gave you something because I want to control your soul. I know you want that thing, you love that thing, and as you hold on to that thing, I have a string tied to that thing. So as I pull that thing, because of your love for that thing, you follow this. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, in the past, I didn't have any string on you. So I was, what can I give to this person? So I gave the person, the person held it, and then I start pulling. But everywhere God says give, check the next verse. He will say, this is what is going to happen. He says, if you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord, and God will repay you. He says, give, hoping for nothing from the people, and your reward shall be great in heaven. He says, give, and it shall be given to you, press down, anywhere. He says, for this thing shall I bless the work of your hands. You shall let. Check anywhere in scripture. Any scripture he tells you to give, he always comes back and does that. He himself, when he gave, he didn't just give like that. He gave so that. Corn of wheat, except he falls to the ground and dies, he abides alone. He said, I'm not just giving my son like that. Oh. We are giving for multiplication. So let God minister it into your heart. Because the grace, all right, in the meeting is tied up also to this. And pray and let him give you the exact thing he wants. No addition, no subtraction. This is it. And inside your own heart, all right, you decide that this is what we are going to do. All right? The, the power you express on the outside is the quality of the spiritual sacrifices you offer upon to God. The power you express on the outside. I heard this or someone else say this, and it's true. He said, if you look at the Hebrew 11, he says, God starts on faith. The first manifestation of faith is giving. He said, then after giving of Abel, then he went to the lifestyle, your work with God. And he talked about Enoch. Then he went to the work, an assignment God will give to you. He talked about Noah. And then he said, that is the build-up. Then he got to Abraham, which is possession. 
Many of us want to do possession without this, without fellowship with God, without assignments from God, which means in service, we just want to go for give me the land. All right? And so we are jumping the thing. He said that is the divine order of faith. And, you, and I agree with what he said as being the truth. All right? So with this... Um, four things here, okay, get set in, um, inside um, your, your, your heart, all right, for an encounter. We're going to put out a schedule, we'll put out the schedule for, for, um, for the days. So every day, somebody will be taking um, prayers, maybe from 9 to 10 or 8 to 9, depending on the time, all right, to make intercessory prayer for the um, conference according to the days. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for your word. I ask by the power of your spirit to establish this truth in our consciousness, cause it to bring forth fruit within our lives, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Let it be that uh, Wathbeck becomes a point of contact of your power and wisdom to us for transformation and for manifestation to answer prayers. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. All right, uh, please, the, well, I don't, I don't really think I need to, well, maybe I need to announce it. Uh, we said we we're going to have a workers' party this evening. It was supposed to be this evening. Because people have sent me messages saying that um, the campus pastors did not give them card, that maybe there's a problem, that they are being left out, that they maybe, well, this has to do with outside campus, that they came from Igomu, they went to those campuses, they were workers in Igomu, but they are not yet inside the workforce, so they don't know them, you know? And since they don't know them, they haven't given them cards. So please, what will happen to them? Well, the truth is, the reason why people haven't gotten cards is that um, the, the workers' party has been postponed. It will have been next Sunday. But I realize that they are playing World Cup final. And I don't want the men to be under any pressure. All right? If France is playing Argentina, it will be very difficult to consent. No, I said if. I didn't say it will happen. If France is playing Argentina. Oh, okay, if Morocco is playing Argentina. Okay. I understand what you're saying. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If Morocco is playing um, Argentina, all right, I, I, and people will be under severe pressure. If they hear Morocco score, this is a historic meeting. I mean, the Africa wants to win World Cup, and I'm here eating. They may not, you know, it may not be. So we will move it to a more... All right, appropriate time. All right? God bless you all.